Hello again. Today we're back in the dwarf fortress that we've been making in Rimworld. And I have to specify that it's in Rimworld now since the Steam version of actual dwarf fortress has just released. I've been playing it a lot and you'll see it on the channel relatively soon. But that's in the future, what's happening now? Well, you'll remember we'd just woken up on day 206 after a very bad dream involving the fortress enduring 35 waves of raiders. The fortress is really neat and it's going to get a lot neater, but what's the goal? Well, it might seem sort of dull to you, but I'd quite like to build a ship and fly away in it. Which would require a Persona core. You'll remember last time I sold one of those. Oops. Oh well. While we wait around to see if another one shows up, let's continue to build this fortress. First things first though, we should probably drop some shells on this siege that's shown up. And while we're at it, here's Trudy demonstrating why I like to have people in strike suits. With that problem solved, I made a few drones to help run the place. Haulers and cleaners. Largely to run up and down these long tunnels bringing back material from the deep drills. And it's a bit odd to use these drones from VFE Mechanoids with all of the Mechaniter stuff in the game now. But it's currently my only option. I'd like to have a Mechaniter, but psychically deaf colonists can't be Mechaniters. So I'll either have to mess with someone's genes or just recruit a filthy human to do it for us. We'll see. The colony is far along enough now that I feel like I can start to enhance some colonists. So I put a circadian assistant into Sam, because as long as I've got a source of plasteel and gold, I've got advanced components. But to be fair, I don't actually always have a source of those. Last time I played a colony like this, I had a mod that let me scan for specific minerals, but not this time. It's just down to luck. And apparently it's that time of the year where the dwarves go goblin mode on the dance floor in an attempt to summon another of their own kind to the colony. And just like the first time, it worked, and we got Zinair. Zinair? Zina? Hmm. However you say her name, she's alright. A quick sleeper, but incapable of intellectual work. And I'm coming to the realisation around this point that the dwarves own this whole chunk of mountain and should treat it as such, so I'm constructing walls along all of these tunnels and keeping them nicely lit. Of course, this is mainly so that it doesn't take quite so long for colonists to travel down them, but it also has the nifty side effect of looking really neat. One of my favourite members of the colony though is actually not a colonist, but a sentient mortar. A large group of manhunting guinea pigs attacked and the thing just sprung into life without a second thought. You might think this is a waste of munitions considering the turrets would obviously have no problems dealing with guinea pigs, but I like to look at it as converting munitions directly into laughter, and that makes it worth it. Oh look, Trudy's pregnant again. She's a fertile little dwarf, that one. And to protect Trudy's fertile lady garden, I loaded up a test map and played around with the idea of a tox box or a burn box to add on to the entrance, which I could open up whenever a particularly rough raid was coming in to help thin them out. And I wasn't overwhelmingly pleased with the result, it works, but it leaves a lot of not-quite-dead colonists in a very unpleasant environment, meaning you often have to send someone in to go and finish them all off executioner-style. This tends to make that person quite sad. Regardless, I actually did throw something onto the mountain homes, because every little helps if things get desperate, I guess. Uh, speaking of desperate, I'm desperate to see my subscriber count keep going up, so if you've been enjoying my stuff so far, I'd like to enjoy some of yours in return so click the button. And follow my Twitch too. I'm trying to stream a little bit more often and it's always fun to have more people in the chat. On my last stream I started a solo Mechanite run and it went terribly, which was apparently very fun to watch. Anyway, back to the dwarves. I needed to grow a load of extra stuff, starting with these explosive Promethean bearing blaze bulbs. So I dug out and started to work on a space down here by the hospital, because that seems like a smart place to grow the volatile fire juice plants. And artificial ecosystems are great, but they do require a lot of advanced components, which means filling this room will take some time. They say it's good to have something to work towards though, so, you know, there's that. A rather worrying event comes next in the form of a mech cluster containing an EMI dynamo, which shuts down all of your electricals for as long as it's active. So it doesn't start active, but as soon as I shoot at it, everything will go dark. And to make things worse, its defenders will start running at the colony, which will at that point be defenceless. In other words, Chef needs to not miss with the mortar. 
Later on, I realized that I should have Chef spot for someone with a pair of binoculars, but on this occasion, I just called upon my old friend. Blind luck. Chef got it done, and then it was up to the turrets to deal with the centipedes, which are quite scary. I have AP rounds in these turrets, which is helpful, but not really enough at this point. I should probably install some higher tech stuff in here. After all the dust had settled, there was a centipede left bugged in the tunnel, just sitting there, so I just left him there. It's fine. We didn't want to go out anyway. And 40 minutes later, it just woke back up and came out all by itself. No idea why, but whatever. I took a quest to fend off two Itakin sieges. I can't actually remember what the reward was, probably just some junk and some plasteel. I was hurting for plasteel pretty badly at this time, so I'd just take any quest that gave it as a reward. The first siege landed and got set up. They took a few shells and decided to take their chances in the tox box. So, it works, but I'm not entirely sure that I like it. For your enemies, it's a tox box. They slowly trudge through, eventually collapsing, and most of them die. But for your colonists, it's just a box full of very upsetting work and lung rot. The obvious solution to this problem is to have lifter mechanoids do the dirty work. But ultimately, at the later stages of the game, a significant number of most raids are wearing protection anyway. You know, turrets are just fine. Usually. Anyway, the second siege dropped in a bit of a weird spot, too close to the colony to actually siege it, so they spent a while milling around in confusion, and after a few minutes, they started wandering off to the other side of the lake, at which point mortars happened, thus ending them rightly. I'm keeping the tox box, and even at some point, augmenting it with explosives rather than tox bombs. But ultimately, ammunition is cheaper and easier to produce than IEDs, so I wouldn't recommend this unless you're doing something more specific. Like, if I were playing a colony of tox people that benefit from the tox clouds, then yeah, sure, that makes sense. I'm sure I'll play that colony eventually, but for now, back to the fortress. Where there's actually currently a solar flare going on. Very boring events, aren't they? They don't really last long enough to actually pose a real threat, so unless they coincide with something else, they might as well just not have happened. And at this point the dwarves never actually need to go outside. Apart from to operate the mortar when sieges and mech clusters arrived, that is, but that's still within the confines of a wall, there's just no roof. It's very nice to be completely self-sufficient like this. The population grows once again thanks to Trudy's fertile lady garden. This baby pops out and gets the nickname Tomo which can either be Tomo, the North English football hooligan, or Tomo, the young and respectful Japanese man. It's up to you. Since we've been here a while now, everyone's expectations are getting high, meaning it's probably time to replace some of the very practical but also very boring concrete with something a bit nicer. Carpets, in nice dwarven shades of brown and orange. Perhaps it'd be more appropriate to start forging bronze by the ton and laying it down with nice inlays of gold but carpets are nicer, so we're doing carpets. To be honest, it's mainly because I realised that you can't paint the concrete. Fortifications mod creator, if you're listening, please give me painted concrete. Another unfortunate event happened here, where a mech hive raid dropped right next to the colony entrance, managing to just sneak a scyther into the artillery area, which I just had to let run rampant until it blew itself up. His friends wandered through the tox box, which by now was the tox and high explosives box, because of course that's another weakness of the pure tox box. If you can't send mechs around it somehow, then they'll just waste all of your munitions. I did get an Arcotech arm, possibly from that Itakin murder quest that we had earlier, and I stuck it onto Chef. I'm not sure why I picked him, but he does a lot of crafting and of course cooking, so now he'll do those faster. And something I never mentioned about Mister is that he's a pyromaniac which is one of those traits that some people will just flat out refuse to have on a colonist. Because it can end a colony if a fire starting spree is timed badly, especially with combat extended since it provides so many more things that can explode. As you might imagine, I'm bringing this up because he decided to have one of said sprees now. If he were near anything really dangerous, I'd have given him a smack on the head and put him in jail, but I figured he's safe enough and let him go nuts. Once he was done, he gained the desensitized trait, which is a pretty useful trait to have. I could try and figure out a way to restrict all the corpse hauling and the like exclusively to him since he's totally unfazed by it now. I didn't do that though, I just thought it was worth mentioning the idea regardless. Another gang of Itakin decided they wanted to run into the box of death, which did its job. I can't say it's not effective, it just comes with too many annoying extra steps. 
Like, why do the fleeing raiders have to break all the doors on the way out? With turrets, you just have to put new bullets in. Here you have to rebuild doors and barricades, all while standing amongst corpses. Once more, it's just not worth it. Or maybe it is worth it, because here's a massive group of manhunting Fenrirs. The maze hasn't been fully rearmed since it's immediately after the last raid, meaning they can just slip straight through pretty much entirely unharmed. Maybe slowed very slightly by the initial tox build-up, but that's about it. Which means this one's entirely up to the guns, which, as it turns out, may not be entirely up to the task. One slipped through relatively unharmed and luckily went after an auto-hauler rather than a colonist. I sent the also luckily nearby Trudy and Caldwell to go and deal with it while it was fixated on the little robot like a big dumb husky with a Roomba. So that was a bit of a close run affair, but to be honest I figured it was quite unlucky to have gotten manhunting Fenrirs anyway and quickly forgot about it. Something I wanted to be able to do is remotely switch between forcing raiders through the maze or directly into the kill box, so I had a quick look around and found this mod, Doors Expanded, which provides remote doors, which are pretty much exactly what I'm after. I think RimWorld could generally do more with this kind of thing. Complex mechanisms and logic systems would fit right in if you ask me. If you have any good mod recommendations along these lines, let me know. If I could operate defenses via pressure plates, that would be pretty cool. To be honest though, my RimWorld mod list runs badly enough. I probably shouldn't be asking for this kind of thing, but you know how it is. Anyway, I set up this simple system that can operate the doors with a pair of levers in the main hallway. There's not much I'd really need to send through the maze, but it's a nice option to have. I may or may not have also slipped in the improved scanner mod to smooth over the plasteel and gold issue this colony's been having. To steal a phrase from a frog, don't question it. At some point in the last little while, I also blew up that mechanoid thing out there and grabbed the transponder from it. I mentioned earlier in the video already, but this is when I actually realised that a dwarf couldn't be a mechaniter. And some war caskets dropped in here, which is always a bit worrying, but on this occasion they were actually held off entirely with the mortars, which is nice, if a bit lucky. Less nice is the fact that we're run out of mushrooms. Now don't panic, there's hundreds of meals, but this is obviously a sign that our farm is no longer up to the task of feeding all these little bearded mouths. But rather than subject Bucky to yet more mushroom picking, I've decided to employ robots. I've never used the auto sower and harvester from the VFE mechanoids, so this seemed like a good time. I made a little space down here by the artificial ecosystems and set them to work. They're very cool. Look at them go. Very slowly, but... Hey, it's better than doing it by hand. Aside from the fact that I have to manually start them every time, it would be nice if they could just automatically cycle the fields, but oh well. It's honestly worth it just to watch them go. And along similar lines, it would actually be nice to have something more than simple meals around here. I set Chef to cooking some fine vegetarian meals, which are made exclusively of mushrooms. Just more of them. I'm not sure how you make an entirely mushroom dish finer by adding more mushroom to it, but sure, we'll go with that. Reliably sourcing meat in the mountain could prove a bit tough. I think that with the help of one of the vanilla cooking expanded mods I can actually make vegetable milk or something and have that as a second ingredient, but I've got no idea whether or not the tunnelers would protest to having peanut milk mixed in with their fungus. That's something to think about later. We'll just make more mushrooms for now. And it's time for another jubilee of burial, which once again isn't a funeral, it's just a dance party, which sometimes results in a colonist. And this time we got Ash, who's very mediocre, but mediocre is fine. I have plans for Ash. And at the same time, Tomboy grew to adulthood. We didn't actually follow her story very closely, but I assure you she lived a very happy and fulfilling childhood in the mountain homes. Here's a lovely montage. Now she's got a big bushy beard. 
Also the traits Tycoon, Fast Learner, and Heat Inclined, alongside passions for melee, mining, cooking, crafting, medical, social, and intellectual. Like I said, happy and fulfilling. I can only imagine some of the absolute powerhouse pawns that come out of super long form colonies. Breeding is very powerful. Moving on, here's a load of folk from the kingdom, come to have a go at the kill box. I'm not sure where this strange bouncy pawn behaviour is coming from, probably one of the various performance enhancing mods I have installed at this point. Whichever it is, I really don't love it. But regardless of their strange movements, these guys skipped straight over the fuck around part and went straight to finding out, running away very shortly after arriving. But we've all seen poor naive kingdom folk getting turned into mush already. It's not that interesting to watch anymore. This on the other hand, look at it go! Look at all the mushrooms! Amazing stuff, I'd love to see it. Once I'd broken out of the auto harvester trance, I captured this nice lady called Fabigrate because I've seen enough traders now and not one of them had a gene pack for psychic powers. So Fabigrate will become the colony's mechaniter, once she's been recruited. I figured I'd recruit her and then stick her in this indoctrination pod to convert her ideologian, but then we went and did a masterful conversion ritual so it didn't matter. It's kind of strange that you can't force prisoners into these indoctrination pods, but whatever, moving on. Tomo grew to be a child, and grew absolutely incredible hair in the process. He's our very own little ginger Fabio. And I mentioned that I had a plan for Ash as well. She's going into a war casket. I put her into a shock casket because it would be nice to be able to send her to sites on the world map more quickly, but I discovered later that for some reason that feature just doesn't work at all. Not sure why. Another annoying discovery is that for some reason the war casket grav hammer is classed as a piercing weapon. When I created the ideologian for the colony, Way of Stone, I set their weapon preference to blunt, because dwarves use hammers, that's just the way it is. So instead I'd sample a number of different war casket guns over the next little while here, eventually settling on the folding gun, which I find to be a good balance for a solo war casket operator. It's got enough punch to put down big mechs, and enough bullets to handle swarms. I also pretty heavily augmented Ash, firstly with a circadian half cycler, because sleepy super soldiers aren't really an option. I also replaced her legs, lungs, eyes and arms. Now let's blitz through some stuff because a lot of things happen between here and the end of the video, and I don't have time to focus on it all because I'm being consumed by Dwarf Fortress. Fabigrate joined up and I made her screw that thing into her head like I said I would. She got a little space down here next to the entirely unused genetics equipment in which to do her weird mech stuff. Chef must be shooting very strong swimmers because Trudy got pregnant yet again, and then we fought off the Diabolus, which is much more of a threat in combat extended thanks to its armour, but it probably didn't help that Ash was using the war casket shotgun at this point, which is a bit crap. After putting it down, Ash went for this ancient danger that we found whilst strip mining. It was full of a few big scary mechanoids which became full of big scary bullets. I have no idea what came out of the hermetic container in there because someone opened it while I wasn't paying attention but it wasn't a tech print because I set a specific shelf for those and none appeared, so whatever I guess. And yet another defoliator landed, with a small military of militors this time, which die remarkably easily. We had a very messy raid of more advanced war caskets which interestingly included Tyna, who apparently didn't get the war casket memo. I had Ash target him specifically instead of the big scary space marine that was running at her with a knife. I'm not exactly sure why I felt like I had to do that, but I just did. The war caskets did their vile business all over the kill box, and it's always a bit of an anus twitcher when they show up. Thing was going like a rabbit's nose on this occasion. Ash had to use her body Hodor style to deny entry further into the mountain until enough raiders had been killed for the rest to decide to flee. I consider myself lucky that these particular space marines do in fact no fear. I made a mental note to add something with EMP to the kill box, since they fry war casket users' brains for a while. A little later on I took some prisoners from a raid of Itakin to use as subcore farms, but more pressingly we're actually still struggling for mushrooms, so I made another considerably larger auto farm up here. Look at that thing go! I could watch this all day, but we don't have time to. I called the War Queen down to get more mech tech and had Ash stand in the doorway here and slowly shoot it to death all by herself. 
While she was doing that, Trudy was busy making another baby all by her lonesome. Apparently I didn't get a doctor to her quickly enough and that thing was coming out like right now. She was fine and so was the baby, which got named Cab. These dwarven women sure are something else, huh? Now, back to the important stuff. Look at that auto harvester go! Look at all the mushrooms! Somehow, despite all the mushrooms, spirits weren't exactly high in the mountain homes. So we had another jubilee. Uh, no free colonists this time, but it still made everyone happy, and then immediately following that was an unforgettable... collective fair. Yeah, one of those. Forgot to name that one, I guess. An enormous herd of rabid elephants tried to do a boat murder to our little fortress, which resulted in a great many tusks to fill the warehouses with. In a very boat murdered fashion, they just stood around outside rather than running into the kill box, refusing to either face death on their own terms nor just leave. So I had to send Ash out to gun them down en masse, which is where we see the folding gun doing its work. An elephant did make it into melee range of her, but don't worry, Tomboy has the situation in hand. I forgot that I had her sat on the artillery to barrage the elephants as they came in, and she landed an absolute stunner of a shell two tiles away from Ash, killing that one elephant and probably really annoying Ash. I made further additions to the fortress, like buying some chickens and setting them up in a very grey and definitely not free range pen next to this deep chem pump jack. I just like chickens and figured having them milling around would be worth the performance hit. To feed them I created this very large area of soil within the mountains thanks to the tilled soil mod, which would be lit by these sun lamps mounted on steel pillars along the sides, allowing for free movement of the automated farm equipment. However, none of this lovely idyllic homesteading would ever come to fruition, because there on the horizon once again, like a twisted visage of the Rohirrim at the first light on the fifth day, are knights in shining armour from before, only this time we're the Urukai. I don't exactly know how or why, but while milling around outside they caught a glimpse of Tomboy over here and broke in. She was restricted to indoors, so in theory they should never have seen her on the other side of this door, but for whatever reason they did and they got in. I did try to fight them off, in probably not the smartest way, which would have been to try and draw them back into the kill box, but these dwarves have lived their entire lives with an extremely limited first hand experience of combat. So they, or rather I, panicked and, well, everybody got mashed to a pulp by giant sloths. And that one angry muffler. Everybody except for Ash, who is actually entirely immune to sloth-based weaponry, and slowly punched them all into the ground. But it's safe to say at this point her mind was basically just a repeating vision of her friends and family's deaths at the hands of the furry menace. So in a final act of defiant madness, she detonated the colony's chem fuel stores. Because if the dwarves can't have it, no one can. Please remember to remain indoors. It worked for the dwarves for about a year anyway. 367 days to be exact. And thanks to those of you that have decided to support me on Patreon by the way. That's very kind of you. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye. I'm gonna go play Dwarf Fortress now.